Welcome, Madam Mayor. It's great to be able to host you here from one awesome mayor to another. Uh, let me begin with a few thanks to uh, uh, Bloomberg Philanthropies, Patty Harris, Mayor Bloomberg, for really awesome leadership uh, in, in philanthropy. Uh, mayor Muriel Bowser, uh, the great team at Atlantic, led by my friend David Bradley, the great team at my organization, the ASP Institute, led in putting this together by Libby Franklin and Kitty Boone. So, you are an extraordinary leader. It is such an honor for us to be able to host you here today. And let's just jump right into it. Uh, you lived away from Sierra Leone and, uh, and your city for a while, and then you came back. What brought you back? Thank you very much, Dan. Um, the return back starts, well, I guess I should clarify something. Yes, I lived away, but um, as so many people know now, the world's a global village. So even though I, I was working in London, Sierra Leone, Freetown was still my home. So in the whole 20 years or so that I was abroad, I got involved with the war. I set up a not-for-profit in 1999. Um, I started to do invest in the economy um, in 2011. But that was all doing that commute, as you do across the Atlantic. Um, but in 2014, there was an outbreak of Ebola. Um, and I was in London at the time. The first case was in May, 25th of May. And uh, a state of emergency was declared in July. And I found myself unable to watch it on TV. So as the case numbers rose, um, and after doing some advocacy and media you know, appearances, raising the profile and trying to get international interest and support, um, in November, on the 13th of November, 2014, I got on a rather empty plane and flew back to Freetown um, to volunteer and be involved in the Ebola response. So that act, which at the time I thought was a three month, okay, three months, this will all be over, I'll play my part, I'll come back, get on with my life, went on for a year. Yeah. And the outbreak was declared over on the um, 7th of November, 2015, um, by the month after I arrived in Freetown, I was asked to lead the response as director of planning for the National Ebola Response Center. So when the outbreak ended, um, I said, I got on a plane on the 11th, got a call three weeks later, and it was an honor, really. I was asked to lead the recovery priorities program, the post-Ebola for the government as a consultant. And I suppose that's, that's what really took me. So Ebola, and then I stayed on and... and um, and, and then, as you, people say, one thing leads to another. But in, in, in this case, yeah. um, I suppose working with the government, particularly on issues which were really challenging, caused me to see what the municipality was like, what council was like, what local government was like. I felt there were some gaps. Yeah. And I thought I might step forward and try and do something yeah. about it. And you did that and, and saved lives. Um, 25 years of private sector experience. Um, uh, an accountant, uh, all kinds of work on strategic planning and strategic development and partnerships, and then suddenly you go back home, you say yes to saving lives. And uh, what did you learn from that experience of leading the effort against Ebola? And then why did you go on and decide to put your name up and run for office? Um, Ebola is most easily the most challenging experience, that Ebola response that I've ever had in my life. For, I think most people saw it on their TV screens and you know that it was you know, death by touch. Um, but when you have a situation where hundreds, thousands of people are dying um, and there's no cure, and what you need to do is really change behavior. So what did I learn? The biggest thing I learned, and I still really practice it very much in my role as mayor today, is the importance of bringing people along with you. Yeah. And actually, the Bloomberg program, there, there's a session um, with the Harvard, Bloomberg Harvard, where they talk about narratives and the story of we. And that is something which, you know, um, I learned during Ebola and fine-tuned here with Harvard Bloomberg. Um, the decision in the end, like I said, was really driven by the concern of the lack of provision or the lack of action being taken about something that I feel really dearly about, 
and that's the environment. So I said I saw gaps in the public sector, I saw gaps in the local council, but those gaps really, at the time, that were most visible to me, were around sanitation and the environment, the rapid deforestation of our city, um, and the impact that that was having on people's lives. So you're, um, you know, you're a real sort of management geek. Uh, you care a lot about counting and getting it right and demonstrating progress towards big goals. And you've led that way. You've established a whole plan with all sorts of outcome measures to try to improve the quality of life in Freetown. And um, how's it going? What, 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 what's been the result so far? Really encouraging. Yeah. But let me start off and just give people a little bit of a picture of what yeah. Freetown looks like. Um, geographically, it's mountains, a plain, and the sea. So we have the Atlantic Ocean. It's absolutely beautiful. So I'm doing my tourism pitch here. <laughs> anybody planning your holidays, you know where to go. Um, but against that beauty are some really significant challenges. Um, from two, from up to 2001, we had an 11-year war. I grew up in a city with 500 people, 500,000 people. Um, after the war, the population doubled to a million. Um, it's now growing at 4.2% per annum. And so we're estimated to be 2 million people by 2028. Now, Freetown, in terms of geography, accounts just for 0.1% of the land mass. But we now house about 15, over 15% of the population. So really densely populated. And that has been the driver for a lot of the challenges that we're now grappling with. Challenges with the environment, with deforestation, the destruction of the mangroves, because people are looking for a place to live. I often say that the American Constitution, that line in pursuit of happiness, speaks for the, the world over. Everybody wants a future. So they're looking for homes, they're cutting down indiscriminately, there was no urban planning, the waste management systems had broken down during the war and they hadn't been put back. So I came into a city, or came into this position with statistics which went something along these lines. Only 6% of liquid waste was being collected. Those of you who run cities know how bad that is. 21% of solid waste. 38% of children under the age of five dying from malaria, which again is linked to sanitation. Um, and a, yo a young population, 75% of my population, my residents are under the age of 35 but 60 to 65% of them are either unemployed or underemployed. So a little bit of a challenging, little bit of a challenging sort of um, landscape there. But to your point, yes, I love data, um, which is why I just love Bloomberg Harvard. Um, and from a management perspective, we came in and my campaign given that I've never been in politics before, never been in the public service, my campaign was very much sort of, you know, PowerPoint, here are the strategy, <laughs> this is what we're going to do. And people said to me, forget it, you know, you need to just set, spend money, print T-shirts, have music. <laughs> um, but they underestimated um, the extent to which people actually do want to pursue happiness. Yeah the extent to which they do want to see somebody who's laying out to them how their children's lives can be better than their own. Yeah. So we did that, and it was called, our campaign slogan was for a community, for a progress, for a free town, which, when coming into office, became our transformation plan. Hashtag Transform Freetown. Yeah. And Transform Freetown has four clusters. Resilience, human development, healthy city, and urban mobility. And within those four clusters are 11 priority sectors. And here I'll just say, I know for most people when you say the word priority, and my team kept saying that, you expect it's gonna be less than five. Yeah. But when you're starting from a base where everything is broken, we have 11 priority sectors and I make no apologies. Yeah. So those 11 priority sectors really, from environmental management to urban planning and housing to revenue mobilization, and let me just say a word here for anybody who's thinking that you've got budget challenges. When I came into office in 2018, um, the revenue collected that year was the equivalent, equivalent of $1.25 per person. So we have a long way to go. But the good news is, for our 11 priority sectors, we have set out, I'll take you back to my Ebola days, and the understanding that you've got to bring community along. 
we had in my first two months focus groups with 15,000 residents in 322 communities, and we talked about what we wanted to do. We then got technical professionals in, we got central government parties in, development partners, NGOs, community-based organizations, and for each of those sectors, we set teams. And we've come out with 19 targets, 37 initiatives. We will move the dial. We will transform Freetown. It's a journey that started, and it's a journey that I'm convinced. Thanks. So what are some of those targets? Um, in sanitation, we're moving from that low base to at least 60% safely collected and disposed of. In housing, there hasn't been any housing built for over 40 years, and there's been no planning. There actually is no building code, and there is no plan. So we're building a master plan. We're introducing a building code. We're introducing new sanitation legislation. It, with education, we're bringing in monitoring of schools and um, um, impacts of teachers. Um, when it comes to revenue realization, we are increasing taxes. And I said it in the campaign, and we've done it. We increased local tax, we increased market dues, we doubled. And we only had 25% of our population of the properties uh, actually on the database. We're going through a process now, we started the pilot, but we're now geomapping the entire city. We use technology a lot. We have an app called Find Me in Freetown, um, and that basically locates you wherever you are in the city. It tells you what your ward is. It tells you everybody who collects waste, and we're just building on that. We're creating jobs in the green economy, but we're also promoting jobs through tourism. Our Discover Freetown campaign is being launched in the next couple of weeks. So there's a lot going on, um, and we're really excited. When it comes to flood mitigation, we lose, we, we, you know, the city had terrible flooding. Um, that was a low-hanging fruit. We tackled that as soon as I came in. For the first time in five years, in 2018, there was no flood. And that was because of the work that we did. So we're building confidence as well. People are seeing at a practical level that there is now a local government in their city. I feel those that are watching the Democratic primary yearning for this kind of voice. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask you this, though? Here we are gathered together with mayors from 44 cities with one of the great philanthropies in the world uh, supporting our effort. What can people here do that could be a help to your work in Freetown? Well, I want to first of all acknowledge that I'm sitting here. And that is already a help to my work in Freetown. Uh, and for that, I want to say thanks to Mayor Bloomberg and his team and to the Harvard team and to all my colleague mayors. And we've been saying that over the last few days. Those of us who are in BH2 cohort, um, we're all still in touch. Um, and we really, really encourage one another. Um, teaming. We do a lot of that uh, in Freetown because I have a city of 1.2 million people. But I walked into a council with a staff of 500. So, and that's right across the board. So that begins to tell you where our capacity challenges are. So on a practical level, I know every mayor in this room already has enough on their plate, and they're probably not thinking about how they can help Freetown, but just in case you are. <laughs> Just in case you are. Um, resource, we, we, we've had great support um, from around the world. We've had people volunteer, engineers come in and says, I, say, I want to be part of this. I've had some great consultants from McKinsey, six now from different parts of the world, who've given their time pro bono, three months at a time, taken, uh, made an arrangement with McKinsey. They've been very supportive of that. You know, we've got um, agencies, Mayor's Migration Council, who are supporting the work I'm doing on migration, which is an issue. My view is that nobody should be crossing the Atlantic, um, or not the Atlantic, but you know, the, um, crossing the Mediterranean, because they feel forced to. People need to have an option. Yeah. They need to have the choice to stay home and have a good life at home. So we work with the Mayor's Migration Council on, on um, some initiatives to engage with strengthening some of our job creation, skills development um, um, targets. So from here, private sector, we're looking at um, some 
concrete bankable investments, which will make a big difference in some of our infrastructure challenges. But of course, like I said at the beginning, capacity, you know, teaming with other cities who may be in a position to want to learn. It's two way. We've got a lot to offer in spite of all the challenges. Because we've gone through that, because we're going through that, we've got insights too that could be shared. Indeed, this world is woven of many strands and our fate is to become one and many. You're leading the way. Thank you so much, Mayor, for being here today. Thank you. Thank you.